Hi everyone, long time no see. It's great to see you here on this episode of the Jampot Adda. A warm welcome to each one of you. So many years ago, when I was in Jamshedpur, I worked at a place. I was done with my 10th boards and I had this summer break and I wanted to be productive. I wanted to make myself useful and I also wanted to earn some pocket money. Uh, so I joined the school uh, where I met this exceptional young woman uh, who was also a teacher there. From what I remember of her is that she was very soft-spoken, very gentle, very patient. Uh, as that uh, summer break got over, I moved on, as did she, and we lost touch. She, however, went on to become an author with several published books to her name. Now, years later, I'm going to be seeing her here today on this episode, and I'm really excited to reconnect with her. So who are we speaking about? Nandi Tapos. She writes fiction against the backdrop of dilemmas, individual, situational, cultural, or patriarchal. Her works detail journeys of women to self-awareness despite being bound by social sanction and gender equivalence. This body of narratives aims to bring mature women back to the readership mainstream by addressing issues and situations which are relevant and intimately related. To hear about her life, um, her journey, her experiences, and her books, let's hear from the author herself. Welcome, Nandita Di. Thank you so much for being here with us today uh, to share your life experiences as a Jamshedpurian and as an author. And it's really, really wonderful to see you after so many years. Uh, thank you for having me on here, Rupa, and your team. Uh, it's always wonderful to reconnect with Jamshedpur and people I knew there. So this is, uh, you know, a double pleasure for me. <laughs> and I hope uh, uh, you enjoy this uh, conversation with us. And I, I'll just plunge right in uh, with uh, the very first question that comes to my mind. So PhD at IIT Bombay. Now we, Jamshedpur, Jamshedpurians are known to aspire to go to IIT for engineering, but you did something altogether different at IIT. So tell us about your journey from Little Flower School in Jamshedpur to IIT Bombay. Um, well, I was, you know, throughout a very mediocre student. Uh, the only person who saw a great spark on me, in me was uh, Sister Helena. And I probably think that her teaching us literature in, you know, in grade 10 is what really made me want to delve into literature, you know, in, in, in slightly uh, a, more, um, a more serious manner. And uh, okay, so then, you know, I studied as much as I could in uh, Jamshedpur, which is up to my MA at uh, JWC. And then I came to this fork in my life where either I had to pursue a career or get married. <laughs> and marriage basically meant that I had to worship one man. And, you know, that was not something I was ready for at that point in my life. So obviously, I had to look for somewhere to go. And, uh, you know, the best offer that came to me was IIT Bombay. And it was a perfect fit because, you know, uh, for, for me, where I studied, JWC had up to MA and no higher studies. And IIT Bombay had only higher studies, MPhil and above, and did not have you know, their own students whom they would probably handpick if they had that, you know. So then I was one of the lucky people who went and, uh, you know, I had always wanted to make it on my own. So, you know, that was like a lucky break for me. Well, which you did for sure. Uh, so, uh, you know, when we were all growing up in Jamshedpur, we, most of us are uh, voracious readers because we really didn't have anything else in the name of entertainment. So books were our escape, our window to the world, etc. So I guess that you liked reading too. So who are the authors that you grew up reading? And at that time, did you harbor any dreams of becoming a writer? I think every writer begins with, you know, loving books. And um, I have, like, you know, faint memories of really fabulous experiences with books. And uh, one of my childhood experiences being taken to, you know, and this happened very rarely, books were not that easy to come by. And 
mostly budgets, you know, and particularly the telco salary budgets did not really stretch to buying your kids a, an entire library, right? So um, I'd go to uh, this uh, shop and I remember it's a corner shop in sector market. And it was basically a general store, but it did have one tiny shelf of, uh, you know, Enid Blyton's. <laughs> and on a very special day, I would be asked to choose a title. And, you know, sometimes we also got those one thin uh, you know, Cadbury chocolate. And that was like, you know, th the best way you could be pampered in those days. And yes, coming back home, opening the book and writing your name very proudly on the, you know, on in the book. So I actually grew up reading like all Indian kids of my generation, very lopsided kind of um, reading uh, experience, but we all grew up reading Enid Blyton, you know, throughout. Absolutely. And uh, I remember even in my ninth and 10th, I went into this phase when I wanted to re-explore all the children's books, you know, the naughty, et cetera, et cetera. In hindsight, I think I was trying to see how she wrote. You know, I wanted to see the mechanics of being a writer. The next experience that I remember is, you know, all these little lending libraries that sprung up everywhere, which had these major Mills and Boone stashes. And we would just go here and there and pick up, you know, maybe two Mills and Boone for 150, one rupee 50 pesa or something, you know, for a week. And then we would try to read it in three hours and pass it around to make the yeah, most of that most 150 of rupees, you know. <laughs> so five friends would pick up books at their costs and, and then we would exchange it. Yeah. So we would try to stretch that 150 ru rupee, uh, you know, I mean, I mean, one rupee 50 pesa. 50 pesa. I don't yeah. mean 150 <laughs> rupees. One rupee 50 pesa. We would try to make it stretch to at least five or six books, you know, in that week's time. So, and I think that that also made me want to be a romance writer, which in, I, I don't call myself a romance writer as much as that I write on relationships, you know. And I think reading all those books about women and their wonderful lives made me want to write about Indian women who do not have such wonderful lives, you know. <laughs> so that, and I remember, uh, you know, the, the community library at M53, Yes, you know? yes, yes. And I remember borrowing two books that have had a profound impact on me. The first was English August by Upamanyu Chatterjee, because, you know, it was to me, uh, you know, everybody who wrote before wrote with seriousness and, you know, with scholarship and with a sense of a higher noble purpose. And this was a person who was telling us about life as it is and being very irreverent. Being, irreverent, irreverent. Yeah, and, and also overtly, you know, se uh, explicit con content. Yeah. So and I was like, yeah, and I was quite tickled by it that, oh my God, books can do this as well. And the other book, and few people know of this, is a book by Salman Rushdie, which is actually his first book which won him an award and it's called Grimace and it's basically a sci-fi book very I mean you may find a copy here or there but very few people have heard of this book you know they all his other books have been much more famous but this was science fiction and brilliant and I think slowly the idea that you know this is what what one should do if one is be, has been given a mind you know and that's how I started my career of first reading and then moving on to writing. Lovely. And uh, so uh, I get that you, you know, were reading and you probably at the back of your mind were enjoying it so much that you were making these little notes and all that. And that came in handy. But when and how did you actually begin writing? So I remember you telling me about my journey to PhD at IIT, and I believe that that stint of being a researcher and being an academic writer, I mean, you know, you have to write papers and you have to keep doing your submissions, which have to be very, very, uh, you know, thick, gluggy prose. Mm -hmm. And I think the habit of doing that, you know, was a huge setback in my life. So I feel academicians, unless they are very, very uh, alert and very awake to the two styles of writing that is demanded of them, are not good writers. And unfortunately, my bread and butter was in academics for a while. So, you know, for a long time, um, you know, I, uh, the writing ambitions took a backseat. Also, as I kept reading more and more arcane books, I knew that I could not write. So, you know, it became a, a very negative exercise for me. The whole foray into academics was negative for me in the sense of 
how to tell myself to write. But, you know, I had a situation where I was facing burnout in my business in 2009. And I took six months to decide what next because I couldn't continue where I was. And one little tiny voice popped up in my mind and said, hello, didn't you always want to write a book? Mm -hmm. And so 2009, November, I started writing. And, you know, obviously no one writes in straight lines. So I wrote one book. Uh, I mean, I started one book, wrote eight, 10 chapters, got thoroughly disillusioned with it, started another, started a third. But by the end of December, uh, by the end of, say, August 2010, I had at least three ready manuscripts, you oh, know. Oh, wow. That's, yeah. that's yeah. quite a, a yeah. large number. Yes. And, you know, Rupa is a lucky name for me because my first book was picked up by Rupa, <laughs> Rupa Publications. Okay, great. <laughs> and... Uh, so has Jamshedpur in any way shaped your writing, any influences, any instances from back home that that come up in your uh, stories? I think there are, you know, a million kinds of ways to tell stories. And for me, you know, I, it, it's probably uh, my own fear, my or, own inadequacy. I always try to write of mythical scenarios, you know, not scenarios that I know. So I keep feeling that if you're a fiction writer, you need to invent, you know, whereas um, I did feel that going back to Jamshedpur would be nonfiction for me. And I was not equipped to deal with it, you know. So all my stories are set in Kolkata, which I only visited. You know, I was always an outsider there. So the observations were more acute. But Jamshedpur is where I grew up. Jamshedpur is me, you know, and I could not do justice to it. With There's all your emotions, probably. I think we're yeah, all connected yeah. with our emotions and therefore right, we take right. that step back and probably yeah, get that yeah. objectivity, which is required. Also, there's just too many experiences. Which one do I, which one do I do justice to, you know? So, uh, so all of that. But now I feel I keep going back in my imagination and my thoughts. I keep going back to Jamshedpur. And I do know that there's a Jamshedpur novel going to happen soon, you know? Oh, wow. That would be nice. Would love to read that. Yeah. But Jamshedpur is how, you know, we are. Like you said that, you know, We all read because there was nothing else to do. We all read because we grew up in a very literate place. Everybody, you know, particularly in Telco Colony, you met everybody who was a professional. You rarely met anybody socially, you know, not on a transactional basis, not as a shopkeeper or somebody who you're paying for their services. But whenever you met somebody socially, that person was educated and that person was reading. And that is the power of Jamshedpur, you know, that it made all of us. It gave us all, you know, this impetus to read, to think, to be intellectuals in our own way. True. I, I, I completely um, agree with you. So what is your uh, writing process like? I'm, uh, firstly, I want to know a lot of authors say, or earlier they used to say, I have to feel my pen, scratch paper, etc. So do you write on paper or you're on a laptop now and what's your process how from conceptualization to you know your characterization to the conflict that your characters go through till you know you reach the end of your book how what's your process so actually each child you know each book is like a different child one child demands a cesarean section one child will pop out at seven months one child will let nine months go and still not pop out you know so it's it's similar with books there are certain books that came to me fully formed you know and it just took me the period of writing it there are certain books that I needed to craft over time and funnily enough you know when I read back there is nothing to choose between them in terms of quality you know but it's just that you know the process was like that but I try to sit at my laptop for at least three to four hours five days a week, if possible, you know, sometimes, of course, you know, the pandemic has been very bad for creative uh, people. Um, Sometimes I'm not able to do that. But that's my attempt that at least I sit at my laptop. Initially, I wrote by hand, you know, with an ink pen on notebooks. Then this whole thing of getting that into a laptop, and then, you know, that transcribing, In a way, it was good at that time because I was editing. But, you know, the whole uh, process was so uh, taxing to me overall that 
I just decided to, you know, sort of learn to streamline my thoughts and put it on uh, the laptop once and for all. And that's worked too, you know, for, for I think my last two books were on laptop purely. So, you I know, it the, works both ways. I think the advantage uh, on a laptop is that uh, you can delete, you can rewrite, you can undo, you can save, you can go back three days later and make changes and, you know, it's right. still sort of intact and you right. can keep all the versions, which I'm, I sometimes wonder how uh, authors in, you know, decades ago, how did they do that? Because every change would require a fresh page. Yeah, or, sure. Yeah. Sure. So it's, you know, it's unlike, uh, I mean, I had an, uh, a conversation with an aunt of mine a few days back and she says, oh, you must be rich, you know, being an author. I said, oh, my God, how little do <laughs> I, you know, people know about writers and little do they, we, we make practically no money and the work <laughs> is really hard. It's really, really hard. So even if you're sitting at a laptop and, you know, it takes about six months to maybe a year, if you're a very finicky writer who, you know, sort of polishes every single word in your uh, manuscript, it could take up to three to four years. Then it goes for editing. Then right. it comes back to you. And then you start the rounds of the publishers who may or may not publish you, you know. So there's all of that. Wow. Sounds like it's something that you really need to be passionate about to Yes. But like, that's like any other work that yeah. other people yeah. do. You have to you know, be passionate about what you do. So uh, you just said that um, something about uh, motherhood, etc. So uh, taking off from that, I, I know this is a question similar to that. I mean, uh, if I ask any mother, which is your favorite child, they probably have a hard time answering. But if you were to choose from amongst your books, um, your favorite one, which one would that be and why? I, I, I... Uh, let me tell you that this is a cruel question. Okay, <laughs> it's not an easy question to answer. Yeah, like Sophie's and, choice. Yeah, it's like Sophie's choice. So, actually, each book, like you know, if what we tend to believe is that a writer has one voice and writes all the books in that voice, you know, uh, yes, there are many similarities in the background. There are many similarities in the style. Once you're, uh, you know, familiar with two or three of my books, you could read a book blind and say, yes, this has been written by Nandita. I'm guessing all of that would be true just stylistically, you know. However, each book has a different thing to offer and it depends on where you are in your mindset at that time. The book I'm most proud of, actually, there are two books, but I'll come to the one that, you know, I, I um, wanted to uh, talk about. This is actually an extramarital love story. Now, this is a dangerous path to tread if you're a romance writer, because there are so many ethical issues, what is right, what is wrong. And I've had a lot of conversations with people over this book. And some people have even asked me, so are you recommending that everybody have extramarital <laughs> affairs? I said, see, there are people who are committing suicide in my book also. I'm not recommending suicide. I'm saying in this this particular story, it worked. In another story, it may be the wrong decision to take. Are you, I'm, are you talking just, about Shadow and Soul? Yes, I am oh, talking I've about that. Shadow. Did you like it? Beautiful. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Beautiful. So, you know, this and I tried to break all the norms without, you know, being a flag bearing feminist. I talked about this 36 year old woman who was married off very early, like 2022 and I think 2021. And then she was, you know, she had a baby before she even realized what had happened. And at 36, she has no role to play except run, run the house and take care of a child. And, you know, she's just longing for a little more. And into this comes a much younger man who is an artist. And, uh, you know, so the story takes off from there. So I thought and I I have a great deal of difficulty depicting sex on paper. You know, it has to do with my generation, I think. But in this one, I didn't, I mean, of course, I didn't go explicit, but I didn't flinch from getting them into bed, you know? Yes, yes. I, mean, and, I you know, that. Yeah. Yes, yes. So they do go to bed because I assume that, you know, there is a healthy sexual component in all romantic all relationships. relationships. And Definitely. I thought this should be a part of it too. So, you know, this is the one book that I feel I did achieve language wise, thematic wise, you know, everything that I set out to achieve, I did achieve in this book. The other book that I would like to talk about is my book of poems. Unfortunately, it's not available right now because my publisher has, you know, shut shop 
and will open again after you know the pandemic is settles a little but you know it's my poetry book and i'm very proud of it because in that i don't have fiction to hide behind you know it's not happening to other people poetry is happening to me so right. that you know so my my one book of poems though i don't think of myself as a poet at all but the fact that i pulled out a po- book of poems from inside me is you know something to really uh, um, you know be proud of for me yes uh, yes i'm sure uh, because uh, i've not very often seen uh, authors writing poetry right right so yeah if you manage to you know cover both uh, genres that's really remarkable right and which has been the most difficult to write or the most challenging there is a political novel so do you remember me talking about upamanyu chatterjee a little while back yes definitely like you know as yes. one of my inspirations so i actually met upamanyu chatterjee somewhere and you know while i was talking to him i said you know this man has achieved so much and what am i doing i'm writing romances i must you know challenge myself and i did challenge myself to write what i consider a form a very mild form of a political thriller and it's set oh. you know in singhum district i mean oh. in in a fictional uh, small town in singhum district and this has a lot of our geography it has a lot of our actual uh, you know um, geopolitical problems it has maoists it has temples it has family clashes it has clashes between settlers and adivasis all of that as well as to you reproduce know, the milieu so to speak yeah yeah so this is in a sense it is a romance but it is you know when you read the book you'll know that it's not really a romance but you know this is a book where i have gone deeper darker and most authentic to what i would like to be as a writer but unfortunately that book has not yet uh, found a publisher and i'm still hoping you know because uh, they tell me that for a writer the only you know the only sport worth p- pursuing is the collection of rejection slips so i'm on that <laughs> journey you know fingers yeah. crossed i hope it happens yes. soon <laughs> so among all your personality traits which one is the one that you think helps you the most in your literary journey i'll come back to you saying that in jamshedpur we had nothing to do but read right mm-hmm. so i became a fact collector you know i'm i was very curious and i still like you know if i write about a food item in in my book i will research it and only then insert it in my book even if it is a simple dal you know i will not take it for granted that if i say dal it means the same to everybody you know so i'm you know very meticulous because my curiosity drives me to say that anything that comes into a book is looked at as uh, you know as gospel that people tend to look at authors with a sense of authority you know or look at authors as somebody who has authority and therefore authors should be curious and they should be informed you are writing and uh, i think your objective probably is uh, to have women readers but i want to know is that your only target audience do you have other people who read your books and what are some of the reactions that you may have got along the way to your books so my background as i told you has been academics right and i felt that i want to break from all shackles and write exactly what i need to write you know and when i sat down to write i felt that let me replicate the joy that the mills and boon gave us but there were two things that i did not like about mills and boon one that you know they were all situations that were too alien to us i mean who falls into a man's bed you know uh, the same night of a party i mean it does happen but typically it just uh, you know leads to a one night stand a week stand and then you're you know it does not really um help push along a very healthy romance so i couldn't figure out the you know the social settings of mills and boon and i couldn't s- figure out also the fact that it was very formulaic after you read a f- you know a few hundred mills and boon you realize that there's a formula by page this by page that by page that and by <laughs> page 186 it has to end you know and i wanted to break free from that kind of uh, thing and uh, so i when i wrote started writing romance i was very happy and soon the you know i started feeling very diffident with what i produced i felt oh my god people are writing such important books and 
you know, this is a feeling that everybody gives you, you know, powerful men writers, powerful women writers, because to be a serious writer, you have to write on topics that uh, actually interest men. If you're writing about relationships, you're writing about the home, as Jane Austen did, then you're always, you know, under the, you know, under the baseline of history. Even if you write a terrible book, but it's about, you know, a war or it's about whatever, you know, about politics and it's about a disease or it's about something which is, you know, nonfiction, slightly disguised as fiction. People prefer reading that rather than reading, uh, you know, um, fiction as women see it. So I have subsequently been very self-conscious and always asked, you know, my male readers that, you know, I would warn male readers that this is love. You know, do you want to really read it? Because we assume that men don't. And then I realized that that's the flip side of patriarchy because men want to read certain things that they feel would make them understand women and relationships better. And I have a huge number of men coming back to me and discussing my books with me. And another good source is young men who buy my books and go and tell, you know, uh, their girlfriends that that lady is my friend, you know, that that author you know, <laughs> she's my friend. So she signed this for you and all that, you know. So, yeah. So men readers, I have a lot. I mean, I would say almost 60 percent of my readers are men, though the books are very women centric. Oh, lovely. Yeah. So have there been any... Um... Um, experiences or reactions that come to your mind? Do you have like uh, uh, loyal readers? Uh, who, I, I do have, I do have, with you about your book. I do have loyal readers thanks to social media because you know mostly I'm reclusive and not that I'm I'm reclusive by personality but if you have two children you have no other life you know <laughs> you're just stuck at home taking care of your kids so um, I am reclusive by nature and I found there are at least 15 to 20 people who have every copy of my book at home that I know of because they've got back to me. I remember there was some, uh, you know, some conversation going on on Facebook and a gentleman who was around 68 at that time, I'm guessing, he could you know, he replied to that conversation talking about all of my books. <laughs> and I completely fainted. I didn't even know that I have readers like that because I thought all my readers would get back to me or, you know, discuss my books with me. But my best reaction was when two neighbors came home after my first book was published and, you know, they had bought a copy each and they, they called me and said, can we come over? And while talking about the storyline and what they liked, one of them actually started crying because in that story, you know, the, the husband and wife come to a near divorce situation, right? And while talking about how she was, you know, how uh, my heroine, whose name is uh, Paroma, uh, you know, how Paroma was um, hurting, this lady cried. And I think, you know, I was like, oh my God, this was nothing. It was just fiction. It was a figment of my imagination. And it's moving a grown woman to tears. Yeah, and you definitely know, must have touched a chord somewhere, you know, some sort absolutely, of... Uh, absolutely. Uh, must have related to it, empathized with the situation. And fabulous. And it and also I, gives me feedback that my books are so realistic that women see shades of themselves or shades of other people they love in those books, you know. So that gives me a great high. So uh, tell me, Nandita, the, if... Um, if you could turn time back and do something differently, what would you do differently? See, the road to the career of a writer is always littered with regrets, you know. So there are many, many things that I could have done differently. Do I regret it? Not at all. You know, I feel every mistake I made and every path that I went down uh, and, you know, ended in a dead end actually added to all my experiences and added to my enjoyment of life also. See, I wouldn't be happy today if I didn't really know what doesn't work for me. And there are plenty of things that didn't work, you know. So, and I mean, one foot in the grave and all that, if you're not happy, then, you know, then you've not had a life at all. So absolutely no regrets. I'm very happy. And I'm also in the moment, you know. I don't want to be 20 because I was stupid and, you know, <laughs> uh, incapacitated when I was 20. I was full of all kinds kinds of, you know, uh, imaginings and phobias and stuff like that. So I'm very happy to be my age and I'm very happy where I am today. And I think that's a lesson to be, you know, in the present throughout. Because one fine day you'll also die. But even at, at the moment of dying, if you're in the present and you're, you know, you, you only are grateful for being there. That's enough, I feel, with life. 
I'm, I knew you when you were in the 20s and you were certainly not how you're describing yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were always very sorted and you know the kind of person who one could go to for advice and you'd give really sound advice so I don't agree with that at all but, but I must you- tell you this when you said this I remembered in my 20s like along with doing my uh, graduation I actually taught at Little Angel School and when I look back I remember that I was you know I was the youngest probably one of the youngest there because I was like my first year BA so I was like what's 18, 17, whatever. And I was the strictest teacher there. And there were students who feared, you know, <laughs> they, they would be misbehaving until somebody said that Nandita is coming, you know. <laughs> and I wonder where that, uh, you know, that part of me came from. But, you know, uh, perhaps that's the little class school, which was very strict in discipline, etc. Maybe it was that training. But yeah, so I would really love to reconnect with any little angel students that I taught because, you know, obviously you don't keep in touch with little tiny tots and I wonder where they are and what they're doing. So if you've been taught by me, please, you know, find me on social media and say hi. Uh, And um, so what's next now? What's in the pipeline? More books, always books, right? So um, there is one idea that's been worrying in my head, you know, going round and round. And I've been telling myself that, like, you know, why don't you just finish the unfinished ones? But uh, being the ass that I am, I'm probably going to start writing it sometime next week, mm-hmm. you know, and then see where it goes. Some books don't materialize, you know. That's the good thing about being in isolation, not reporting to a boss. If it's a project on which you've spent six months and it's got nowhere, uh, you know, it's fine. You can always let it go and, uh, you know, you can always revive it later. And I'll give you an example. When I told you that I had submitted three, uh, uh, three manuscripts, you know, for uh, review, the one manuscript, no, I, I, I don't think it was that. It was just after my book got uh, published, just after Tread Softly, I submitted a manuscript which got rejected by Rupa. It got rejected by about eight or nine other publishing houses, and it was just sitting with me. And as luck would have it, some other editor of Rupa read it in 2017, loved it, and it came out in 2018. Oh. Am I saying the dates right? I think 17, 18 or 18, oh, yeah. 19. It oh. came out later. It came the- out much later. It came out almost eight, 10 years after it was whatever. And that's the difference between a newspaper or a magazine and a book. Because a book is always, you know, it, 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 it is always current. It could be about, you know, uh, 1 BC. It could be about 10,000 BC. It could be about 10,000 AD. You can right. travel, you know, you can time travel with books. So I don't mind the six months that, you know, that go. So it's always going to be books. But yeah, I do have, you know, these little uh, projects that I take just to amuse myself. And currently it's geology. So I'm teaching myself a lot about stones and minerals that we can have. And, you know, so I'm I'm like into, into like, I'm like a, a trainee geologist right now. Just, just from what I can learn on the net. So is your next book set in the backdrop of some geological uh, uh, project? It it could be, it could be, but you know, see, um, it's very difficult to write specialized books in India because uh, I actually thought that the book that I was telling you about, which came out lately, that's the last uh, fiction that got published, um, that's about rock music. And I thought people, you know, and it's it's actually the hero is a rock musician and the heroine joins their band as the fusion artist and she sings classical music. So the whole book is about Hindustani classical music and rock. And each of the chapters are named after one rock anthem. So I basically felt, you know, all the rockers in India would either buy the book for themselves or buy it for their girlfriends or whoever is interested in romance in their lives. But it doesn't work that way. You know, Uh, it's it's very difficult to find people who know a subject, even know that this book is out in India. You know, we do not have a network of publicity like, you know, all like a movie. You always know what a movie is about because they have crores of budgets. You know, we don't. We only have word of mouth. So um, it would be very difficult to float a book on geology. But yeah, I love what I'm learning. I love how beautiful rocks are. So, yes. And my previous madness was aquaria fish, you know. I at one time had five aquarium at home and, you know, I was like completely into fishes all the time and all that (laughs) until, you know, somebody told me that it's very cruel. Then I gave all the aquarium away. And (laughs) it's it's like my on my bucket list that I'll have one large, like really beautiful aquarium. 
So oh, wow. yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's great. Um uh, so Nandita ji it has been such an enjoyable conversation and uh, hearing yeah. about your journey about those little memories about M53 and Enid Blyton and all that it just it's been such a wonderful uh, conversation and i must tell you that you're still as warm and kind and gentle and the patient as you were back then oh. despite the success oh that that's that's <laughs> that's really nice to know you know because what happens is externally you change and people just assume that you've changed and it's so nice to get feedback that i haven't because i've always been like this you know so, yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah like i said yeah you would be the person i would have turned to at that time for advice and now that i've reconnected i feel the same sort of uh, you know vibe and i would uh, pick up the phone and call you i think if i ever needed and maybe relationship advice <laughs> always <laughs> always and uh, may i just tell your um, tell your viewers tell our viewers actually that um, if possible do pick up a book of mine if you can't pick up a book of mine pick up any indian writer you know particularly uh, see all of you all get a salary at the end of the month but you know we just wait that once a year we we get between 15 to 5% of our book sales as our royalty for the year and typically it's a very low figure and now during the pandemic you know the publishing industry is really going through a bad time so buy indian books like you can read all the western authors just read them download their books somewhere i don't care whether they get royalty or no but <laughs> indian authors please do support the industry i i totally uh, agree with that and yes i would urge everyone to uh, grab a copy of uh, Uh, Nandita Bose's books, and uh, you can be sure that it's going to be a soul-stirring, soul-searching kind of a journey as you read her books. So uh, do that, and uh, Nandita, we keep writing and making us proud. I'm so happy you said proud. I don't know, but thank you so much for having me. Thank you for listening in. Thank you, everybody, and all the very best for your future books and whatever else you wish to do. Thank you. that was nandita bose successful author of books such as tread softly ever glow if walls could be shadow and soul and many others you heard her let's buy books of indian authors and definitely those of fellow jamshedpurians right so do buy her books for some poignant intense honest and insightful writing on relationships human nature emotional conflicts and dilemmas and let me tell you her language is very impressive with that it's time to say goodbye i hope to see you soon but till then take good care of yourself